one of the greatest things that we can do for Pastor Wayne is is can just continue right like he's here and praise and worship just like we normally do because it's not about him it's about him and you know he knows that and he wants everyone here to know that and he loves everybody so let's go before the Lord of prayer and let's also pray for Pastor Wayne Heavenly Father Lord I come before you tonight Lord Lord, I ask you to touch Pastor Wayne right where he's at. Lord, touch his illness, the great living God. Lord, I ask you to bless the remaining part of this service, God. Lord, let us enter into worship of you, God. Lord, like only we can, God. Lord, I ask you to touch each and every heart and mind in this sanctuary in Jesus' name. And everybody said, turn around and shake somebody's hand. Amen. Do you feel like traveling on tonight? If you don't. Maybe you will by the time you leave, amen? Well, my heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Nor pain nor death can enter there. I feel like traveling on. Well, yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home. Oh, it's glittering towers, the sun outshine. I feel like traveling on. That heavenly mansion shall be mine. I feel like Oh, come on, lift it up to him tonight. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly. Well, yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. Oh, my heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like tra- I like this verse right here. The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on. Oh, unto that blessed home. Oh, lift it up to him tonight. Come on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I f- Let's do that fourth verse one more time. Well, the Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on. Unto that blessed home. Oh, let me hear you. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Amen. If you feel like traveling on, then I believe that you think God is great. Amen. We have a great Lord tonight. Amen. This is the new one that... Everybody's starting to like, and I love the part that says it's your breath in our lungs. Amen. Tonight. Just lift your hands and worship Him tonight. Come on, put everything out of your mind and think about how great our God is tonight. Amen. Here we go. You give life. You are love, you are love, you, you bring, bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you give hope, you restore, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Sing that again, you give life tonight. Darkness, you give 
give hope. You give hope. Oh, you restore. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Oh, lift it up now. Come on, let me hear you. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out. Pour out our praise into your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Oh, you give life. You give life. You are love. You
so great tonight that he's worthy. Amen. We haven't done this one in a while. So if you don't know it, it won't take long. And our drummer helped write this song, and it says, You are worthy of all the honor. You are worthy of all our praise. Lord, we give you glory to you, our hands. We raise tonight. Amen. You are worthy of all the honor. Come on, let me hear you. You are worthy of all our praise. Lord, we give you glory to you. Our hands we raise. Come on, you're worthy. You are worthy.
Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty move of God. Lord, I'm thirsty. Pour out your Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me. I'm hungry for a move of God. Oh, help me sing it. Come on. Well, Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty move. God, Lord, I'm thirsty. Pour out your Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me. I'm hungry for a move of God. Can we lift it up just one more time? Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty God, Lord, I'm thirsty. Pour out your Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to see the hand of God who might be inside of me. I'm hungry. Oh, I want to see. Let me hear you sing that part. Come on. Oh, I want to see the hand of God who might be inside of me. I'm hungry for a move of God. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise tonight. Thank you, team. Thank you, musicians. Awesome job tonight. that you will be with me when I'm standing in the fire I will not be overcome through the valley of the shadow
You're my strength, you're my defender. You're my refuge in the storm. Through these trials, you've always been faithful. You bring healing to my soul. Crystal, come on up. Happy Sunday evening. All right. Um, 2 Corinthians 8.12 says, Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly, and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. God doesn't look upon the size of your gift when you're giving and the offering. He looks at your heart. He looks at the intention of man, and that's what he has always looked upon is what your heart says. If you give because you love the Lord and because you want to please the Lord, he doesn't look at it as if, oh, she didn't give enough, so I'm not going to accept that. No, he looks upon your heart, and he sees why you did it. Why are you pleasing to him? So check your heart when you're giving, but giving is good because it does, it stretches you, it makes you grow as a Christian, it's a good thing. Um, but it's time to take up our tithes and offering. Lori, will you pray for us? Right before she passed away, her Sunday school teacher came into the room. And we sang this song together. And also, you know, Isaac was born premature. And Julia we got sort of down in the dumps, you know, because going through all the changes and then staying in the hospital. And right before we came home, her fever shot up to 104, Julia's fever. And they told her that she can't be around the baby. And she was just sort of down. And she went to the room and shut the room and shut the door off. And I took care of Isaac that night. And I asked her how she was doing in the morning. And she said, all night long I sung this song. And it was, How Great Thou Art. And sing with us and worship the Lord with us. the world 
stars I hear the roaring thunder Thy power throughout The universe display Then sings my soul
Good and dismiss Jones Church. Mom, come on up. I'm glad to see you make, made out to God's house again tonight. Just continue to remember Pastor Wayne. Um, he typically does not have headaches, um, but whatever is going on with his head is, uh, has just knocked him out. So uh, just continue to pray for him. Um, also remember Mall Mall uh, in prayer and Paul Paul. Um, her side is really hurting her, and he just have he has some health issues too. Um, in his body that he needs the Lord to move in. And I know that we have some others uh, who are sick. I know Bonnie's been sick for a 
few days now. Uh, if you have a loved one who is uh, sick and just needs prayer, could you just lift your hand right now and just acknowledge that to God? And we just ask in Jesus' name that he touch them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God is good. And what, what, what else can you say about a God who knows every detail about your life, right? He's a good God. Sometimes the old enemy, he tries to overstep his bounds with us. But we just have to look at him and say, mm, Listen to me, devil. Tell you what I'm going to do. You walked on me about long enough. Now I'm going to walk on you. I said I'm tired of you, Satan. You kept me bound too long. Much too long. I'm going to raise my hand toward heaven. I'm going to sing me a happy song. A happy song. Well, you told me not to do it. You told me not to try. But I'm going to keep on serving Jesus till the day I die. I'm tired of you, Satan. You kept me bound too long, much too long. I'm going to raise my hand toward heaven. I'm going to sing me a happy song, a happy song. Well, you told me not to do it. You told me not to try. But I'm going to keep on serving Jesus till the day I die. I'm tired of you, Satan. You kept me bound too long, much too long. I'm gonna raise my head for heaven. I'm gonna sing me a happy song, a happy song. Well, God should have got a right to shout. God should have got a right to sing. God should have got a right to praise the Lord. We got everything. I'm tired of you, Satan. You kept me bound too long, much too long. I'm gonna raise my head for heaven. They came out the winner, devil. You came out the liar. I'm tired of you, Satan. You kept me bound too long, much too long. I'm going to raise my hand toward heaven. I'm going to sing me a happy song. Well, now listen to me, devil. Let me read the word to you in the book of Revelation. I see where you are doomed and I am. I'm tired of you, Satan. You kept me bound too long, much too long. I'm gonna raise my head toward heaven. I'm gonna sing me a happy song, a happy song. Yes, I'm gonna raise my head toward heaven. I'm gonna sing me a happy song. Tidy left to listen. Just snap it. If Pastor Wayne asks who broke it, it was not me, okay? Norman preached tonight and he got excited. That's our story. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. If you're saved and you're happy about it, say amen. 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 If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to go to verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. While you're flipping there, if you can flip to Judges chapter 6 and just hold it with your finger, we're going to flip back to that after we read Ephesians 6. If you can't, that's okay. It should be on the board. Has God been good to you guys this week? Amen. Amen. He's been good to me too. So this is what the Bible says. 
it says a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty, what? Power. Say it like you mean it. Power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. How many of you have ever fought in these kind of battles before? Men, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. We're just going to read a couple verses from Judges chapter 6. Starting in verse 14, it says this. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful night. We thank you for a, a service where we have felt your presence, where we are able to worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. God, right now I ask that you will please anoint this part of service, God, that you will anoint my mouth to preach your word. God, anoint our hearts and ears to hear from you tonight, Lord. Not our will, but yours be done tonight. God, let your word do what it was sent to do tonight. Save souls tonight, Lord. Encourage your people tonight. God, lift us up and give us a word that will strengthen us by your mighty power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Give God a hand clap as you sit down. I was, um, I was volunteering this morning for my work. They were doing a community health fair where they set up different stations and they were inviting the community to come out and to get free screenings for different things for your health. So they had vision, they had a kid's station, which I was slightly envying that station a little bit because you know, that's I naturally go to that station. Um, and then they had uh, you know, cholesterol, they had everything there, right? So I've been going through a training at my work to be a community health worker, and I've done depression screenings before, so they sat me in there with these forms and with a, a lady uh, who was a doctor from UC, and I was going to be her interpreter and help her out, and I was so excited, right? I sat down, I had my forms, I knew how to do this, and I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I knew the words I was supposed to say, I knew the questions that were going to come up, and then before we had our first person come in, they sent us in this random volunteer who had just magically shown up. She was a bilingual psychologist from Children's, right? So like golden child walked into the room. And it was great. I was like, oh, wonderful. You can have my chair. Let me just go find a new job. So they were like, she says, that's OK. They already have one for you. Go find this doctor. So I'm walking around this health fair looking for this specific doctor because he needs an interpreter. And this was the one day that I regret ever learning Spanish. <laughs> they sent me to the, to the screening for men for prostate exams. <laughs> I would like to say I was quoting uh, Philippians 4.13 in my head, but that is not what came to mind. More like, where's the exit? Um, and I did not know those words that I needed to know for that exam. And uh, Google was my friend and not my friend at the same time. And um, praise the Lord, only um, mostly women showed up today. So I got to leave a little early. And the doctor says, you've been a great sport. Here, take this free water bottle. And I was like, that's OK. <laughs> Don't want anything that you are touching right now. So. But I'm telling you this to, to, to make a point, and I'll make a point from somehow. But God will put you in difficult situations, right? He will put you in things that you on your own are not equipped to handle, right? 
had I been able to stay at the depression station, I would have been equipped. I've been through training. I know how to ask those questions in Spanish. And I felt so confident sitting there with her. And, you know, I walked by the kids' station. I was like, oh, if only I could go to that station. I could feel like I could be a, you know, I could be such a good helper for them. You know, I, I love that kind of station. And then they send me out to Egypt, where I don't know that language. And I don't know how to do those things. And I felt so insecure. It was like Spanish 101, where you don't know anything but, you know, the dictionary is your helper. So... God is going to put us through difficult situations, not to make us uncomfortable, but to make us remember that we're relying on him for everything we do. We rely on his strength and his power. And in these passages, God is telling us that we are going into different kinds of battles. We're going to be going through things that we don't understand. We're going to be going through things that we're not equipped to handle on our own. We're going to be going through things where it looks like there is no possible solution but to leave. But you know what God is saying? He says that if you can put on the whole armor of God, that even after you face the fiery darts of the enemy, even after you face every trap and every snare and every evil plot that he has made against you, even if you can go through all of those things, if you can go through all of the flames that he is setting before your life, if you can go through all of those things that he is doing to mean you harm, to mean you, to to hurt you and to try to take away what God has planned for you, to try to take away the joy he's given you, if you can put on the whole armor of God and walk through those things, he says, you will still be standing firm in the end. He has not called us to walk through things to be defeated or to feel insecure or to feel like we can't do anything. He has not called us to be a church where we feel inequipped or we feel powerless or we feel hopeless or we feel like we're always walking around in fear and in discouragement. God has not called a church to be like that. He's called a church to be his bride, to be strong, to be beautiful, to be full of power, to be full of might, to be full of hope. And he's calling his church to stand firm. So what he did was he called out this man named Gideon. And if you back up in the story, it starts in Judges chapter 6. And this is what it's talking about, that Israel was in a mess. They were going through some really difficult times. You see the, the Midianites and all of these people... It says that people from Amalek, from Midian, from all around them were causing them harm. And it had gotten so bad, it says that there were so many people that came flooding in that it was too numerous to count. That they were coming in in waves like an army, just surrounding them and taking their food, taking everything. Israel had gotten to a point to where they were so defeated, they were forced to hide in caves. They were forced to hide in mountains, and they were literally starving to death. But Israel cried out to God and asked for help. But you see, you you wonder what could have possibly gotten Israel into this place. What could have possibly had Israel go through these things to to allow them to get to such a place of of starvation and and, and defeat, and it's because they were spiritually defeated first. You see, they, they were a nation that constantly went back and forth on God. They were a nation that constantly turned their back against God and went back to the idols and went back to the to the false gods and went back to the to the worshiping Baal and, and to doing things they knew better to do. They were constantly going back on God and going back into that sinful mindset, going back into a sinful nature and doing things that they knew were wrong. And it got them into such a mess that they started starving spiritually. They starved themselves spiritually. They starved themselves from the hope of God. They starved themselves from the protection of God. They starved themselves to where suddenly that spiritual defeat became physical defeat too. And you see, this is not a place that God has called us to. It's not a place that God has called us to be in a defeated mindset or into a, into a spiritual mindset where we're constantly battling with sin. He's not called us to be like that. He's called us to be a victorious people. He's called us to be a people set apart. He's called us to be a people, of, of, the Bible says, a peculiar treasure, something that, that is his, something that only, that only he can delight in. And this is what the Lord said to Gideon, he said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. And the first thing Gideon says to him is, but Lord. 
You see, when Gideon's talking to God, he's naming all of these things. For me, it's so funny that here's Gideon in the middle of the night, and he's you know, he's hiding under this tree and he's beating the wheat so that he can keep it away from the Midianites so his people can eat. And the Bible says that suddenly God just shows up and starts talking to him. And he's saying, I'm going to use you to send the Midianites away. I'm going to use you. I'm going to send you out to defeat all of these people and you're going to rescue Israel. And it's the Lord that's talking to him and he knows who he's talking to. Because he says, well, if the Lord was really God, if he was really our God, the God who rescued us from Egypt, the God who did all of these things, why are we sitting here starving to death? And how many of us in the church have ever gone through a different battle, have ever gone through things that are difficult or uncomfortable, or you feel like there's no way out, and then you start to wonder, well, if God was really God, if God was the God who can heal all diseases, if God was the God who can heal all sicknesses, if God was the God who can save people from anything, why am I going through this battle? We start whining, we start complaining, we start thinking that our situation is too big for God. Our situation has somehow missed God. God's radar, and now we're the only ones suffering, we're the only ones starving, we're the only ones going through anything. But then we think about this, God still listened to all the complaints of Gideon, he still listened to all the things that Gideon had to throw in his face, and he said, but you're going to be a mighty man of valor. You're going to be a mighty warrior for my kingdom. You're going to be the one that I send out. You're going to be the one, the complainer, the one who doesn't realize who you're talking to right now, the one who has forgotten how to praise, the one who's forgotten how to worship, the one who's forgotten how to get on your face and cry out before God. You're going to be the one that I send out, not because you deserve it, not because you're worthy, but because I'm making you worthy. I am making you a mighty man of valor. I am making you somebody worthwhile. You see, Gideon put God through all of these tests. He put God through all of these things, and he said, God, prove yourself to me. Prove yourself to me in all these different ways. And you have this, this man who's trying to get this reassurance from God that God's really in it. God's really going to do these things. God's really going to prove himself to me. God's really going to be there. And when he does, it's like a light switch, and things just start going out and happening for him. You see, we have a church today that we're going through things. Anybody ever gone through anything? Anybody going through anything? And you feel like sometimes you, you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about it and you just don't feel it. Right? You get up and you're looking at your situation and it feels pretty big. Or it feels a little too hard to pray for sometimes. Or it just feels like it's too much. And it's too heavy. And it's just too much of a burden. And you know, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's because it's not meant for you to carry it anymore. Sometimes it's meant for you to leave it at the feet of God here at the altar. And walk out a mighty man or woman of valor. It's time for the church to stand up and stand firm. And go back through the things the enemy has planned for us. And say, but I'm walking out in faith. I am walking out as a mighty man of God. I am walking out as a mighty woman of God. I am walking into my victory. I am walking out and letting God do what he has planned to do. You see, there was another man whose story is told in the book of Judges. It's it's very close after Gideon, and it's the man named Samson. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with his story, but he was a very strong man. You see, what's interesting to me, as I was reading this story, and immediately Samson came to mind, because when I think of a mighty man or this big warrior or a big hero, for some reason I think about Samson because he was so strong. And the Bible says that an angel appeared to his mother and told him, you know, told her, you're going to have this son and, you know, be careful, make sure that you keep all of these specific, you know, standards because he's going to be set apart. He's going to do something great and God's going to use him to save Israel. He's going to use him to do a great work for Israel. But what is interesting about the story of Samson is you never once 
see Samson living for God. You never once see Samson talking to God or praying or doing anything that he's supposed to be doing. You see him using God's blessing for his own selfish purposes. You see him using God's privileges for his own wants, for his own needs, for what he wants. He was a very selfish man of valor. And at the very end of his story, because he was so spiritually dead, it led to his physical death. But at the very end of his story, that's when he began to speak to God and he said, God, if you'll give me strength one more time, if you'll help me one more time, I can destroy all of these Philistines. And God did it for him. But you know, what's interesting about the story of Samson is he was meant to rescue Israel from the Philistines. And at times he just made it worse because he was always causing so much turmoil. He was always going out and picking fights. He was always going out and doing things that got him into trouble, got his people into trouble. He was always walking around puffed up, thinking about himself, puffed up, thinking about how mighty, how strong he was, how he was invincible. He could do whatever he wanted. And you know, sometimes we have people in the church who use and misuse the, the blessings of God or the privileges of God or the privileges that come with being a child of God. They want to twist it and make it good for their own selfish purposes, but they never want to do the things that God has planned for them to do. They never think about the big picture. They never think about the kingdom of God. They think about their life. They think about what's going to make them happier, what's going to make their life easier. They never think about what's going to help the kingdom of God. Is this too hard? Samson got himself in so much trouble. He got himself so wrapped up in the things that he wanted. He, he found a woman that he thought looks good, and he said, you know, go get her for me. I want to marry her because she looks good. And she was a pagan woman. She was a woman who had no God in her. And because he got wrapped up in sin and just constantly wrapped up so much, he just kept getting so suffocated. He suffocated the very blessings of God out of him. You see, you can be born into it. You can be born into church. You can be raised in church. You can be so full of God all of your life. But if you never really live for God on your own, you're never going to really walk into his plans. There are so many people raised in church all my life, Church of God, 25 years now. You see so many people who are raised in it too, who are brought up the same way, and they're just so different now. You know, it, youth camp or different services, it's always like a contest of who's related to who, who's related to the most important person in the room. And um, I'll never forget at youth camp once, um, I was, I was just a worker, and you know, when you're young and you know, you're ready to work, they'll put you to work, especially KYC, they really put you to work, right? I worked the canteen, I worked the camp store, I worked, I, I did everything. I was on the golf cart, just happy to be there, right? And I remember they just kept giving us jobs, kept giving us jobs, and kept giving us jobs. Well, there were certain workers who got the nicer jobs. They got to sit in the tabernacle where it was nice and cool, and uh, it's because they were related to special people, right? And I'm not trying to talk about anybody, but I was in the kitchen and they were asking me where I went to church and they were asking me, you know, well, who's your mom? Well, who's your dad? And of course they don't know who my dad is or, you know, they might know who my mom is, but uh-oh if they do, right? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. You know, they might have heard of my family, but it was when they said, well, you know, and, I, and you, you, I mentioned I went to Newport, and they were like, oh, well, you knew Brother Willem. Well, yes, and then I tell them how we're related, right? And oh, did it change. <laughs> I got moved over to the camp store, and I got to sit in the tabernacle for a little while. I got the air-conditioned job, right? And I was sitting there, and then it hit me. This is only because I'm related to him. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter who anything else. But you know what? That is a stinking 
thinking mindset, right? When God looks at us, it doesn't matter who we're related to. It doesn't matter who your mamma or papa is. It doesn't matter how many prayers mamma has prayed over you. It doesn't matter how many prayers mama has prayed over you. You cannot be prayed up into heaven. You have to get down on your knees and meet Jesus yourself. You have to have a relationship with him all on your own and know him all of your life and know who he is. Know that he is your provider. Know that he is your savior. Know that he is your counselor. That he is your friend who sticks closer than a brother. Know that he is the only one who can save your soul. Your mom can't save you. Your dad can't save you. Brother Willem couldn't save me. It was only by the grace of God that I am still here. You see, Samson had a different kind of mindset than Gideon. Samson was a man who had this supernatural strength, but he had no spiritual strength. He had the physical strength that God wanted to do something great for him, but he had no spiritual strength. And we cannot be walking around, you know, boasting about where we go to church or boasting about the physical things that we have if we have no spiritual things to back it up. You see, he was defeated by sin. Gideon started off with a bad attitude. He started off with bad mindset thinking that, you know, he was doubting God, but he was named a mighty man of valor by God because he was willing to get up and take action. He was willing to destroy the altars of Baal. He was willing to do the things that God had called him to do. He was willing to get up and do something about the sin that was in the camp of Israel. He got rid of the sin. He got rid of the idols. He got rid of the altars, and he built up an altar for God. And it was when he did that that things started falling into place for him. You see, if you can get it right in your spirit, then you can get things right in your life. If things are falling apart in your life, you need to reexamine your spirit. You need to reexamine your heart. If things are never going right for you, yes, you might just be going through trials, but you need to make sure that God is walking you through those trials. You see, a spiritual mindset is transformed. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. You see, you have a sinful mindset that's reprobate, reprobate, if I can talk. And what that means is that the sin happens in your mind first. You see, you look at anyone in the Bible who'd ever sinned. It's not as though they just woke up and decided to sin all of a sudden. No one just all of a sudden decides to walk into a bank and rob it. You think about it first. It happens in your mind first. And the Bible says that if you can keep your mind from being conformed to the world and transform it into the mind that God's called you to have, you can keep away from those sins. You see, a carnal mindset is hostile to God. Romans 8 and 7 talks about how a sinful mindset will lead you to death, but the spiritual mindset will lead you to life everlasting. It talks about it in Romans 4 and 22. I'm going to read this to you for just a moment. Ephesians 4 and 22, it says this, It says, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. You see, we can't make our own minds new. We can't have our own attitude. We can't put our own holy thoughts into place because on our own, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. There's nothing that we can do to compare to the glory and to the holiness of God. There's nothing that can compare to his righteousness. But if we can let the Holy Spirit move in our hearts and move in our minds and renew us daily, make us new, we can walk as a mighty man or woman of God. We don't have to walk in defeat. We don't have to walk in sin. We don't have to walk in those old ways anymore. We can walk by that power of the Holy Spirit that leads us. You see, the Bible says that a a sinful mindset is futile in its thinking. It's always defeated. It's always battling. It's always warring against itself. If you're always battling, if you're going from battle to battle, if you're going from, from, you know, from trial to trial, let the Holy Spirit renew you. 
He never said that you wouldn't go through battles. He never said you wouldn't go through trials, but he said that you can walk and stand firm after going through all of these things. A sinful mindset is puffed up, Colossians 2.18, but the Bible says that a spiritual mindset is positive in thought. Philippians 4, 8 through 9 says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Has God ever given you something good to think about? Has, ever, has God ever done anything good in your life that you can think back on and praise him one more time for? Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. If you're going through a battle, if you're going through a trial and the enemy is trying to make you feel defeated, if you're going through things that is warring with your mind, the Bible says if you can just think on one good thing, if you can find one good thing to praise God about, if you can find one thing, and let me tell you, if you're having trouble to think on one good thing, are you saved tonight? If he never does anything else for you, you are on your way to heaven. You have a, an eternal life with Jesus Christ. On You're, you're, you're pressing towards that eternity with Christ you have everything to praise him for if you never make another car payment if your bank account never gets back into the green side if your house never gets fixed if your if your kids are always fighting if nothing ever else goes right in your life if nothing else ever becomes good you are on your way to heaven tonight you see a spiritual mindset is Christ-like. The Bible talks about having that same attitude of Christ. And a little while ago, we were at revival with um, the, the Church of God in Dayton. And um, there was a guest preacher there, and he was preaching on the power of Pentecost. Any Pentecostals in the house tonight? Those sermons will fire you up, right? Right? Those sermons, you know, born and raised in Church of God, you, you, you live for those sermons. You live for those Pentecostal sermons, right? And we were talking about his sermon after um, when we were at dinner, and it, he, was, he was preaching about needing the power of, of, the, you know, of the Holy Spirit. His sermon was good, right? But there were was, there was some things that he had missed a little bit. He didn't preach anything wrong. He, did, he didn't misquote Bible. He didn't do anything, you know, wrong. He just didn't bring it all the way home for, for some of us, right? It's one thing to preach about the power of the Holy Spirit, but when we were talking, Wayne had asked me what I thought, and I was not going to say what I thought because, you know, it was all right to me. It was fine. But when he started really wanting my opinion, you know, it just wasn't enough for me. It's one thing to, you know, preach home, you know, you need the power, you need the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, I will preach to you. You need the Holy Spirit moving in your life. The Bible says that you need the Holy Spirit to have that renewed mindset. You need the Holy Spirit to, to be walking in the light. You need the Holy Spirit to be guiding you and speaking to you every day. And if you don't have that, you need to be praying for it. You need to be praying that the Holy Spirit will lead your life. And, and I don't disagree with him whatsoever. But Wayne asks a really great question is, well, now what? You have the Holy Spirit. Now what? You know, you, you want the power of the Holy Spirit. Now what? What are you going to do with it? And, and for me, this is where it comes into. Samson had the potential, right? Samson had the potential to be a, a great, mighty warrior. And in a lot of ways, he was. He, he still defeated the Philistines. He still defeated, you know, and, and was able to bless his people by that. But he never lived up to his potential in God. He never lived up to all of the things God wanted him to do or had planned for him to do because he never got into a relationship with God. He never fully got that spiritual mindset because all he could do was pray for forgiveness at the end. You know, I, I don't want to be that kind of Christian that says at the end of my life, I just wish I could go back and start over or I, I wish I could, you know, think back and, and, and try again or, or only be able to pray repentance right before the end. I want to look and, and be like Gideon, where it says that he was able to live in peace for the rest of his life. 
the people of Israel, as long as Gideon was alive, they lived in peace. You see, as long as your family is with you, as long as you have the Holy Spirit moving inside of you and living inside of you and guiding you every single day, your family can live in peace too. They can be free from addictions. They can be free from sin. They can be free from the the snares of the enemy, the trials of the enemy. They can be free from all of those things because if you are in their life, you can speak Jesus over their life. You can speak the power of the chains that can be broken over over them in the name of Jesus. You You can be that healing power you can speak Jesus over their sicknesses you can be you can speak Jesus over their diseases you can speak Jesus over anything that they're facing you can be the one that brings peace to their life Gideon did that for his people he brought peace to their land he brought peace to their lives because he was willing to walk by the spirit of God he was willing to live up to his potential in Christ even though he said but Lord I'm from the weakest tribe of all of Israel and I am the least one in my family if there was anybody that could be better than me the dog could do better than me at this point he said that you know I am the weakest of the weakest and you're picking me out and he says you're going to be a mighty man of valor You're going to do great and mighty things that you don't even think are possible right now. Jeremiah 33, 3 says that you are going to see great and mighty things happen in Christ. Things that you've never dreamed about. Things you've never thought possible before. But if you can have the faith like Gideon, if you can have the faith that says God can do anything, you will see God do great and mighty things in your family, on your job, in your home, in your life. He can do those things for you. You see, it's, do you want to live by the Spirit or do you want to live by your own efforts? And this is what he was preaching. He was preaching, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've heard this message before. I've heard this message before, even as a young girl, saying that there's two parts to Pentecost. You know, there's the shouting, there's the, you know, the running the aisles, there's the turning cartwheels, there's the running the backs of the pews. I've seen it all. I've seen all of these things happen. And it's like Gideon said to God, I've heard all the stories. I've seen all of these things, but I want to see the power of God for myself. I want to see God move for myself. I don't want to just see some preacher running the backs of pews, or I don't want to just hear about the stories of these great revivals. I want to see a revival in my own life. I want to see a revival in my family. I want to see souls saved. I want to see the dead rise. I want to see addictions break. And you can see all of those things if you have the faith and the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. He says, what are you going to do with it? He, that was his question. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you, you have the Holy Spirit in your life tonight? How many of you are glad to have the Holy Spirit in your life tonight? He says, he says what are you going to do with it? Do you know where anyone who's sick is? So many of us mention or raise hands for family members who are sick tonight. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, if you have the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of you, if you know where the sick are, the Bible says that you can lay hands on the sick and know that they'll recover. If you have the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of you, if you know where any lost soul is tonight, you can go and be a witness to them. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be the witness to all of the world. What witness? That Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That Jesus Christ came and died for us to die for our sins so that we can have life eternal with him. Do you know where anyone is, you know, that is addicted? You can speak that chain-breaking power over them tonight. What are you going to do with the power that God's given you? You go find someone who needs that power moving in their life. That's what you do with it. You go find that random place at a health fair where you feel very inadequate and you do whatever God says to do. Even if you don't know what to say, even if you're uncomfortable, even if you wish you were anywhere but there. Because that's what I was thinking. But God had a purpose. 
because God sent so many people by that station who didn't know what it was about. And when I were t was talking to some of the people, there were so many people who just needed help. And I was able to talk to a lot of people who I would have never even passed if I were over in the comfortable station. Ephesians says to put on the helmet of salvation. It says, cover your mind with the salvation. What does that mean? You're saved by faith through Jesus Christ. By the blood that he shed on the cross, your faith in him, that he was crucified and raised from the dead, it's by that faith that you're saved. If you can have the blood of Christ poured over your mind every day, pleading the blood every day, the power of Jesus Christ can move mountains in your mind. Those giants that build up in our minds, those problems, those walls, those insecurities, those, those chains, those bondages, those strongholds, God can break every single one of them down. And it's by your faith that you can walk in a spiritual mindset. You can walk as out as a mighty man or woman of God. You can do all those things through Jesus Christ. There is nothing too hard for him. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me tonight? Bible says in Philippians 2, it says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any encouragement? Is there any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? It says, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. When they were in the upper room, they had one mind and one purpose. They weren't thinking about their own insecurities. They weren't thinking about their problems. They weren't thinking about everyone who ever said that they would never make it to that room. They were in one mind and with one purpose, and they prayed until they received. If you're here tonight and you feel like you don't have the power of God working in your life or you need him to change your mindset, you need him to move you from someone who tries to do it with their own strength into someone who just needs the strength of God to move in their life, to overcome every, every battle that you're facing, this is the place that you get your strength. You seek his face tonight, he's here. His presence is here, his anointing is here. He is ready to meet your need tonight. Why, just so you can go home and sit on it? No. So you can go home and you can testify as to what God has done in your life. Do you know what a testimony is? It's a prophetic word that what God has done for you, he can do for someone else. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus Christ, this is your chance to come to the front and we will pray with you and we will help you meet him and begin a relationship with him. If that's you, will you come? There is no better decision you could ever make than to give your heart over to Jesus Christ. He will never disappoint you. He will never leave you be just like he told Gideon, everything you go through, every battle, every place you go, I will be with you. If you're here tonight and you need God to move in your mind, you need God to move in your life, you want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to come up to the front and we're going to pray. And if you need more of God's power in your life, I want you to find a place to pray. challenge you if this is not something you're praying for right now I challenge you if you know anyone 
who is addicted, if you know anyone who is lost, if you know anyone who is sick, I want you to use the power God has put in your life. And I want you to begin calling their name out before God tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, right now I pray that you will let your Holy Spirit take over. God, that you will move for everyone that is in this place tonight. God, that you will fill them up with your power, with your might, with your spirit. God, let your Holy Spirit have control tonight. Do what needs to be done in in everyone's situation. Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me 
comes from Jesus, but it's the ultimate power. It's a power that can take you all the way to heaven and overcome anything that Satan has to throw at us. You know, it's easy to uh, forget that at times. In our human nature, we, we tend as human beings to look at our circumstance instead of who we are. And um, we got to get away from that. We got to start thinking of who we are in Christ. I've asked all the kids to come in, and when they come in, I would like for you, as the parents, to get your kids and have them set with you. We're going to move over into communion, and I want the kids to be setting with their parents because their parents have.